Good evening. Uh, we acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I'm uh, delighted to introduce Alison Brooks as this year's speaker in the Faculty of Architecture Visiting Architect Lecture Series. I think I've been asked to make this introduction because Alison is a Canadian architect practicing in London, England since 1996. And as many of you know, I'm a former landscape architecture practitioner in London, teaching in Canada since 1998. The public lecture series is supported by endowments from three architecture graduates from the faculty. Alan Wiseman, graduating in 1950, Morley Blankstein, graduating in 1949, and James Palmer Lewis, also graduating in 1950. The lecture series was established in 2015 to bring internationally acclaimed practicing architects to speak at the faculty. Its aims include creating opportunities for students to learn from and interact with internationally renowned architectural practitioners as to their philosophies and practice. And its aims include strengthening the faculty's ties with the Winnipeg architecture community. And in that context, I've been asked to point out that there is a sign-up sheet at the back for um, MAA members for their continuing educational uh, lobbying. So, <clears throat> the lectures are free, they're open to the public, and they're intended to draw on the history and development of architecture and to explore current themes in architectural practice. They're held annually or biennially, although our website says biannually, which means every six months and is not quite right. Um, <clears throat> and they uh, depend, their regularity depends on the performance of those endowments. Last year the speaker was Angelo Bucci from Sao Paulo, Brazil. The previous year it was Alan Bell, a BED graduate from here, and like Alison, an architecture graduate from Waterloo. And also like Alison, working in London with John Porson. Not, Alison's not working with John Porson, <laughs> but Alan Bell is. <clears throat> so, you should all have read the official biography and introduction to Alison and her work. But here's my own personal introduction. Some of you may know that uh, I support a phenomenally average small town football team in England. That doesn't allow me to see much good football, but it does allow me to visit some quite fascinating places. And in March 2012, I visited Cambridge, we won 2 1, and met up with an architecture contemporary of mine from the University of Manchester who works in Cambridge. He insisted that before I leave the city, I must visit the Accordia housing development, the master plan for which <clears throat> received the RIBA Sterling Award in 2008. I did, and I was blown away. It's a magnificent example of integrated planning and design for mixed income, high density housing on a well-treated site close to the centre of the city. I was already familiar with the work of the other longer established architects for Accordia and of the Landscape Architects Grant Associates. But that was my introduction to Alison's work. It spoke of collaboration, it spoke of authenticity, it spoke of social awareness, and it spoke of the most important thing perhaps to landscape architects, response to context. Fundamental tenets of omniscient environmental design. And incidentally, the Sterling Award made Alison the first person to receive all three major RIBA awards, following the Stephen Lawrence Prize in 2006, and the Mansa Medal in 2007. I could continue by reading a list of Alison's awards, or I can leave her time to speak, and I'll do the latter. But by way of introduction to her topic, I would note that to celebrate 21 years of Alison Brooks' architects, she published the book Ideals Then Ideas, Authenticity, Generosity, Civicness, Beauty, an overview of her practice work and the title of her talk this evening. Thank you. Thank you for your very generous introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here in 
Winnipeg for the first time to speak to all of you. Um, it's kind of amazing to see Winnipeg after a, a lifetime of never being here. I think my only, my only knowledge of the place is, is a song by the Weaker Thans, <laughs> which, uh, which is sort of stim one great city, which has um, stuck in my mind and stimulated my curiosity. And um, I can kind of understand uh, the, uh, some of the sentiments in the lyrics, but I find it an incredibly exciting place. Um, it's newness, it's um, freshness, in a way, the emptiness, the possibilities in the spaces and the um, environment that you all work in and live in. So I'm, I'm kind of jealous and fascinated, but I haven't been here long enough to, to form a full opinion. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to the um, evolution of my practice before I uh, start talking about projects in particular. Um, just a map of, of where the projects I've built uh, are, are in the UK mainly. I founded my practice in 1996, so um, 23 years now altogether in practice. I, I kind of went to London accidentally. I just went there on a two-year working holiday visa after I graduated from the University of Waterloo, and I never came back. So um, it's a series of fortunate coincidences, as many architects who are mobile in their professions uh, find. You'll see that there's one, it, there's a funny disproportionate scale of uh, the UK, which is really big to North America, which is really tiny on this map. But you can see one project in Vancouver uh, on the left side of the screen. And um, I am working in Canada at the moment on a major project in Surrey, Vancouver. But it's under wrap, so I can't talk to you about it. But it's been a pleasure working in my home country. Um, but it's also been a huge pleasure to developed my career in London. And um, I really appreciate, in a way, the, what London has uh, given me in terms of a place to practice. And I show this slide because, well, these two slides, so this one because you can see how much green there is in London, how huge it is. Um, and this because it demonstrates that London is pretty much a low-rise city kind of four to six stories with some areas of density. And you can see how well-defined the parks are, the great parks, uh, Regent's Park, the sort of round one, Hampstead Heath at the top, Hyde Park, St. James's Park, and then the urban squares that, sorry, that um, basically were the seeds of development, the garden squares that were originally private and then became uh, public amenities and really characterized the city. I also um, show, like to show this view of London because it's actually looking north. It's not looking at the sort of landmarks around the Thames, but it shows Regent's Park and uh, Regent's Crescent, Park Crescent, which is a great example of urban form, of urban design and landscape design and the kind of human scale of the city and how this has, over time, proven to be an incredibly resilient and adaptable model. And I, I suppose the principle that I consider all architecture urban design, and there's no, there's no um, distinction. You are always acting on, on the city when you build. And the first place I went to when I arrived in London was Bedford Square, which some of you may recognize. This is Bedford Square and the Architectural Association, which is here. Because I felt a very strong affinity to the AA at the University of Waterloo, we really referred to the publications and um, obviously the alumni and the teachers at, at uh, the AA. But I think it's important because, again, it shows the relationship of urban form, built form, to a landscape and um, the principle of the terraced house, the formality of that, of that um, typology, and its adaptability. Basically, most of the terraced houses around Bedford Square are now institutions, their universities, their offices, their hotels. And 
it sort of proves the value of, of housing design and how it can adapt and become many, many other uses if it's, if it's well designed, if it has generosity and good proportions and a kind of um, what's described as the first minimalism, really, is the Georgian terraced house of, of the UK. Um, creates great streetscapes. So a lot of what I have done is also about creating streets, the, the civic space that frames our daily life. And a sort of great civic uh, space that I always talk about as um, one of the great things about living in London is Somerset House. So um, designed by uh, Robert Smirk in 1775 and others. And the principle of in a way, the archetype, uh, archetypal form and the quadrangle being an archetypal architectural and urban form. And in the case of Somerset House, that it has adapted over hundreds of years to many, many different uses um, from, from being um, tax offices, barge masters, flats for officers. But the actual architectural concept was townhouses arranged as a quadrangle. And so housing is actually embedded into this major urban building, which is now the Courtauld Institute, King's College, um, Makerversity, summer concert series, exhibitions, galleries. And so for me, this is an example of adaptable archetypal urban form. And I consider this a kind of quest of, of my practice. This is example, uh, an example of the summer party and I chose Somerset House as the venue for my 21-year anniversary of my practice. This is not my party, but um, <laughs> it was um, maybe in another 20 years. Um, we staged an exhibition in the Embankment Gallery and uh, with, a with videos projected on the walls, um, models, all our models, a big mock-up of the roof of one of our buildings. and. Um, yeah, a, a big party. And here are some of the, this is one of the models that, um, this is a house that I've recently finished in, in Hampstead. And I took it as an opportunity to publish this book um, that was mentioned, Ideals Then Ideas, that I have based this talk on. And I felt it was important to, I'd been sort of developing this idea that I think in architecture schools especially, there's a, um, there's a struggle. You know, as a student, uh, architecture, landscape design students, we're often struggling for the idea. You know, what is the idea? What is the really strong thing that's going to drive my project? And it, you know, just came to me over time and also through teaching that the most important thing is actually to start the project with your ideal, with your your social and uh, political and aesthetic and um, experiential ideal. And from that ideal, you can then develop your architectural ideas. They will flow from that ideal. And the great thing about that is that it's empowering because nobody can argue with your ideals. If um, you state your position, um, it can't be argued. It's just how you express it. And so in, in my book, I stated I, a kind of manifesto for these four ideals for authenticity, generosity, civicness, and beauty, which um, I basically stand by and uh, have kind of declared as being the basis uh, for every project that I do. It doesn't matter if it's a commercial developer or a private house or um, an installation or a museum. This is. I will always strive for these four things, and I will always sort of uh, encourage my clients or patrons to um, share that kind of quest. And within the, within the book, I organized it into these themes and topics. So rather than project by project, I've tried to describe the, in a way, the, the kind of essay or the, the um, the idea that I was, uh, the architectural idea that I've been exploring through each of my projects. So um, one of the, this, uh, one of the ways in which I developed my practice was really in, as many architects do, is with private houses. 
and I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on them in this, in this talk, but just to say that I've always treated my residential projects as essays, that each one is a kind of test. I'm going to try this idea and see if it works. And it should be experimental, and it should be uh, the advantage of a private house is that it gives you a condensed and distilled format in which to write that essay and test that idea. And so this is the VXO house in North London. It started um, from a, with a phone call from a client who said that she'd, uh, they'd suffered a fire in the house and they were redecorating it and they, she really wanted somebody to design uh, some bookshelves. And so that red line is the, the bookshelves that she invited me to the house to design and that turned into this project. <laughs> which, <laughs> so I always say, never turn down a very small commission <laughs> like a bookshelf when you start your practice because it can evolve into something much bigger. And so this, this project became a series of, of projects. It became you know, a front extension to a house, a complete um, conversion in addition to a 1960s house, then a pavilion in the garden, and then a carport, and the idea was to develop it as a kind of campus of, of structures that blur the, the boundaries between architecture and landscape and art. And so this, this wall here, which goes from inside to outside, it's a wall drawing by Simon Patterson. You walk through the wall to go to the powder room. It's a screen, it's a piece of architecture, it's a landscape um, di divider. And I'm happy to say that I worked on this project with a graduate of, um, of your university, Stephen Cox. He was one of my first employees at um, ABA. And he was my project architect. And we built this project. Um, I had a two-week-old baby when we started this project. and. Um, we were working with a builder who'd never built anything bigger than a bathroom before. So it's amazing what you can achieve when you um, have the ambition and the, the care and the talent to, and a client who actually says yes, who sort of takes on board your proposals, tests them, makes you present them, and then says, yes, I want what you think is the right thing. That's the, the best kind of client. So this is the gym based on the idea of a grotto and stairs that are hanging, suspended, and act as a screen. And this project was published in RIBA journals and won awards and basically launched my practice. This was the next experiment, which was, which was about trying to create architecture out of one element, a single plane of brass, three mil thick brass, which is cut and folded to become columns, structure, benches, sunscreens. And it was about reducing architecture to one element as opposed to many, <coughs> which the VXO house expressed. The next project was the Salt House, where I sort of took on board the idea of a pitched roof for the first time. It's a, it's a weekend cottage in a row of um, oyster fishermen's cottages on the seaside. And here I started to ex just explore what happens when you take on board the hipped roof and allow it to kind of um, control the geometry, as hip roofs always want to do, but actually sculpt the perimeter of the building to respond to the views and the context in a way express the wind and the seaside environment. So this was a kind of foray into organic geometries. This um, eventually became um, a precedent for other projects like the Lens House, which is an extension and conversion of a house in North London. And I think it's quite important to talk about this. Well, the name says it all, the idea of a lens, that the, the, the geometry and the spaces are focused uh, on this tree, this big walnut tree. And the idea was to, kind of, again, try to make architecture out of a single plane. And this is Corian. You know the, the material you make kitchen counters out of? It's black Corian. So it's a single sheet material. Um, Lots of complicated structure and insulation underneath it, but trying to really reach a kind of very plastic and essential 
quality of form that responds to internal space. And so this project is, this small building is actually a studio for the client, so it's live work. And even the roof light in the side extension focuses on the tree. And then the conversion of the Georgian house is, um, was an opportunity to open up two floors to create a double height space so that the living room becomes a sort of minstrel's gallery to the kitchen. And the kind of Georgian terrace staircase is, is preserved um, in that scheme. So all of these projects were part of, um, at the same time that I was doing these, I was trying to work in housing. I was doing competitions, European, um, a competition for Urban Splash, Concept House 99. I was trying to break into the large scale urban housing world, which is very difficult when you haven't done it before. And then I came across a, an invitation, a competitive invita invitation, where a developer north of, uh, a landowner north of London was inviting architects and, and developers to bid for a piece of land. So it was a design and developer bid. So I invited a developer to join me to put in a bid for a, a suburban development in Newhall. And this was, and it was for 84 units, and the piece of land was defined, but the typologies um, were not. And so it was about, for me, reinventing the suburbs completely, trying to think about sub suburban housing as a kind of land art, if, if you can even imagine that. But I sort of thought, if I'm going to work in the suburbs and work in low-rise housing, they have to be amazing. They have to be sculptural. They have to be coherent. And they have to sort of reinvent the, the restrictions and norms that normally govern suburban housing as we know it. And so that meant really challenging the, the traditional typology in the UK, which is the five meter wide and 10 meter deep terraced house, which is on a plot that's five meters wide and 25 meters long. And so I proposed to change that into a square plot instead of linear, and within a square plot, you can then start making courtyard houses, T's and L's, and different plan forms. And you can also sort of uh, pack them. When they are courtyard houses, you can pack them. So this was about making back-to-back -back and terraced houses that also um, utilize the roof form to create inhabitable space in the roof, and then the roof form is carved to allow light into the terraces. Uh, in, into the courtyards, and they have a central hall. So it's a kind of T-shaped plan with a kitchen that you can go see through from front to back. So this created a kind of way to pack the uh, master plan with eight more houses, which enabled our developer client to make a really good land bid, and we won the project. And this uh, became New Hall B which is um, now cited as one of the UK's in their sort of housing guidelines papers is, uh, is kind of an exemplar project. It's made out of prefabricated timber. All the ceilings are 2.6 meters high. And one of the key things is that in the ground floor of every house is a dedicated study and workspace. So that I don't know if it shows in the plan here, but. This space here, I had to fight for for two years <laughs> to have it not cut out of the plan because in the UK, nobody builds studies or home offices. And so it's amazing that this room now is actually the favorite room of every resident because they have a place to go and work. And the people who live and uh, work from home really love being on the street and having a, a kind of window to the street. So this project, and this was also shortlisted for the Sterling Prize in 2013, and won many um, awards. It also provides um, things that I really believe in fundamentally, like really generous front halls. The front hall of a house should be like a room. It shouldn't be a corridor. Um, windows for in small rooms need to be wall to wall, floor to ceiling. The bedrooms have a cathedral ceiling, which is what the prefabricated timber enabled. And these are the villas, which have you know, quite a complicated geometry, um, a sort of open geometry of um, um, sort of polygonal rooms, a veranda and porches, and the idea of, of kind of 
really making spaces that are dynamic and that are definitely not boxes or cubes. And the, um, these houses all have verandas, and which is part of a sequence. When you move through the house, you can look out onto the veranda and you go. It's all part of a, a kind of journey. And this informs, um, has informed a lot of my work subsequently. And we also designed small apartment buildings um, as part of the project. I mean, it was part of the overall master plan, but um, these act as the kind of gateways to the, to the, the major streets. So while that was going on, I also felt it was important to try to diversify and work in the cultural sector. And I did a, won a competition for a new performing arts center in Folkestone, which is on the seaside in um, Kent. Folkestone was a really popular uh, seaside town in the 19th century. Um, now it's, it's a little bit neglected because ferries don't go to Folkestone anymore. And it's, it's a kind of infamous, uh, neglected seaside town. And the project site was probably the worst place in all of Folkestone. It's sort of former builder's yard in a really grim street that used to be a beautiful Georgian high street. So our, our competition scheme, apparently we were the only architects who actually took on board the wider context of, of the town center. And with our submission, we proposed a new public square, a boulevard, tree-lined boulevard to connect the Performing Arts Center to the <laughs> harbor, and a new public park to um, enhance the sort of wasteland behind the building. Um, so this was the site. And we, we also tried very hard to find something about the place that was inspiring and good that we could build on. Um, and so the idea of actually, we found these Georgian buildings with scalloped um, heads to the windows. And the scallop shell is a kind of traditional symbol of pilgrimage, of welcome. They fish for scallops in Folkestone. Shells have beautiful translucency and color theater land, lighting and signage and glow. How could we bring these three things together and sort of from that grim site create a kind of birth of Venus experience when you come to Folkestone? So our sort of concept for the building was that the, the skin would be a glowing and translucent surface that would reflect and refer in an abstract way to the, um, to the scallop shells of Folkestone. And these are some very early renders, I think back in the days of 3D Max. And this was um, our competition render, sort of showing the idea of a building that completes the Georgian streetscape. It creates sort of big, inviting openings into a performing arts building that would become a kind of living room of the, of the town. The problem is the, the translucent cladding we propose is very um, fragile, and so we had to replace it with something super robust. And so we came up with um, expanded metal mesh, which we curved into fluted panels. And this forms the, the kind of wrapping of a super compact theater footprint of the auditorium and then foyers at the front and service spaces. But what this, and this was a really low cost solution. I mean, they, all these panels were just welded up and sprayed by somebody local in Folkestone. Um, they're also arrayed so that they change from wide to narrow and um, wide again to enhance the curvature of the street. And it sort of performs a, a function of being a kind of beacon in the city and also being a, a very hardworking and straightforward building. And these are the kinds of spaces inside the sort of ground floor foyer and exhibition, the first floor restaurant that sort of embraces the, the street, uh, the auditorium, flat floor, retractable seating. And the building glows at night. So as the city darkens, the building glows. And it really is, is the kind of center for the creative the creative regeneration of, of the arts-led regeneration of Folkestone. So that project um, basically uh, is part of a, a, a sort of aspect of the practice that, that we've been sort of 
developing alongside housing, because after New Hall and Accordia, we were um, able to actually compete for major urban pro housing projects in London. And I want to talk about housing in the context of civicness because, as I said earlier, I really believe that housing is civic building. You shouldn't think about housing as being commercial building or just development or just places where people live. It is the, the, the building, the built forms that define uh, the public realm, that define the street. And the, the facade of housing is also the public realm. It's not just the ground floor, the, or not just the landscape, that's the public realm. It's also facades. And so the proportions and materials and the, what facades of housing communicates is uh, really important for civic public life. And this condition of reciprocity, I believe, is uh, really critical for housing design. So I'm going to talk about Ely Court, which is a project in northwest London, Kilburn, if anybody knows London. And I show this slide because this is a 1939 map of London. So this was before the war. And it kind of represents the, the perfect and complete Victorian city. And I really think that the 19th century urban designers were great. Uh, we don't tend to talk about the Victorian urban designer as being a kind of uh, hero in architectural culture, but I'm continuously amazed by the kind of coherence and consistency and beauty of the Victorian city design. And so South Kilburn was a neighborhood like this um, with a really beautiful big park, recreation grounds, avenues, boulevards, muse streets, high street, mixed use shopping, um, funny chevron shaped uh, urban blocks. And basically, in, after the war, the area was deemed overcrowded and um, po poverty stricken and dangerous. And so most of it was torn down. So this kind of housing typology was torn down. And this kind of um, prefabricated concrete blocks were built, the kind of housing estates, uh, public housing estates that you see all over London, which were at the time kind of ideal projects. They represented a social, political, economic ideal and which have mostly failed and now need to be completely rebuilt because most of them look like this. They are they're places that have no relationship to the streets. They, um, the street network's been cut off and um, the building typologies themselves generate antisocial behavior and crime and exclusion. And so there, there are literally hundreds of housing estates all across London that are being torn down and regenerated or um, stitched back together with the, with the context of the city. And this, uh, this is the master plan for South Kilburn that was commissioned by the municipality, the London Borough of Brent. And I think it's really important uh, to talk about the importance of the commissioner when I talk about these, the projects that I've done in London because generally the local authorities are taking on the role of patron and steward and commissioner of the city's regeneration. They're not paying for it. The, the paying for the development is a, is a private um, joint venture, but the actual role of, of uh, of commissioning master plans and phasing them and commissioning architects to compete for every phase in the master plan is being led by the local councils. And so it demonstrates uh, the importance of, of city governors, governance to actually implement really positive change and transformation in terms of urban regeneration. So we've competed for and won three competitions in, in this um, in this master plan, which is this area. And you can see here how the buildings are kind of atomized and sprinkled around in sort of open green space. And this is uh, the loss of the traditional city and the, and the street. And I'm going to talk about these two projects, Ely Court up here and Bronte and Fielding House here. Um, so the site that we were uh, given in the competition is this one, a very funny shape of site. <coughs> <coughs> um, 
<clears throat> and um, it's, it's, I always find it interesting the way Google Earth or Bing, Bird's Eye, whatever aerial view you use, the, the green always makes it look like it's a great place because there's loads of trees and it's green and therefore it must be good. But there's a lot of green that disguises kind of poverty, exclusion, and dangerous places. And what's interesting here is that the, the site of the um, South Kilburn Estate that we were part of the regeneration team for, you can see is, is absolutely excluded in its, in its urban form, the buildings, their relationship to the street, um, from this neighborhood, which is a super high value, very desirable um, street and block-based based, um, piece of city. So one side of the street looks like this, really desirable, semi-detached urban villas. The other side of the street looks like this, which is mostly green, but the buildings turn their backs to the street. There's a big sort of tower here hidden behind these trees. And nobody goes into these places unless you live there. So they're, they're basically ghettos. But what I thought was interesting about our site was this building here, which is at the back of the site, which was one of the first tall buildings using reinforced concrete built in London um, in 1959. And um, there's something kind of great about its form. It's kind of uh, boomerang form. It's got a really interesting stairwell. It's, um, the top floor was designed as a huge uh, laundry drying floor, which is kind of incredible in today's terms. But I felt it had value and it needed to be part of our, <coughs> sorry, part of our site master plan. So here in a series of four kind of uh, steps, the principles of our approach to reinstate uh, the address, the buildings that address the street with a terrace block, to kind of break that terrace block to include the boomerang building um, Gorefield House in our scheme, to introduce a new Muse Street to connect the public realm and traffic and flow and safe movement into the site, and then to complete the scheme with buildings that face, face the new street and create a new Garden Square. And so this created uh, this final plan where it's sort of hard to tell what's old and what's new, which I think is also kind of a good thing in urban planning terms, or urban regeneration in particular. And this, this is probably, this slide has the most information of, of any, <laughs> any slide um, I'll show you because I think, um, you know, the housing, in, especially in the terms of estate regeneration, has to operate at so many different levels that it operates to reconnect a kind of uh, excluded piece of city to the streetscape, to the neighborhood. Um, within these three typologies, there are about eight different kinds of, of units. There are social affordable rent units, which are in this block and in this block, and the rest is market sale, and there's different types in there, and this is, a, this is what's called the mansion block typology. And these plans sort of show in um, condensed form how the mansion block works, which is basically a building that's one, one flat deep. You have entrance cores, that lead to a flat on either side. And so you only have two flats per floor per core. And the staircase acts as a landing that enables people from different families to get to know each other. And there are no corridors. And this is another principle of my practice. We try to design buildings with no corridors, because corridors are generally not good things, especially in housing. So there's no corridor. There's just a landing. And your apartments have windows at the front and the back. And so they're naturally ventilated, and they feel like homes, traditional houses, but they're multi-story. So that's what we think is really important is that the scheme as built sort of becomes a, a backdrop to the street. It becomes a device for framing the street. You kind of don't notice it, which I think is also important. Its material has a relationship to the existing um, sort of conservation area typologies. And I thought it, was, it would be interesting to show you this, because this was a little montage rendering we did at the competition stage. And this is the built project. And I really 
always um, fight pretty much to the death <laughs> to keep the competition design as it is. Like, if, you, if you're going to do a competition, if you put the energy into that process, you have to f preserve it through the construction and the, the kind of many, many phases of development. That is um, kind of the beauty of competitions is that you're, there's a vision, and there's an idea, and there's an ideal, and you have to deliver that and push it through. And so one of the really crucial things is that it's a simple building form. All the balconies are recessed. So um, rather than bolt-on balconies, which I try to also avoid, um, where everybody's exposed, every balcony is sheltered. So there are porticos that represent the two-story duplexes here and recessed balconies for the flats. And these become, and, and this is the communal entrance here. And these are the front doors to all the, all the, um, uh, the duplexes. So it basically animates the street, it shades the homes, it provides uh, shelter and privacy and protection from the wind and the rain. And it's also part of a sort of layering strategy, the sort of front garden as a threshold to the portico, <clears throat> which is also a threshold to between the private and public realm. And this is the kind of quality of space that you get in those recessed balconies. This is looking up. And then inside the, the flats, because the balconies are recessed, it makes the, um, the apartments feel much bigger. When you use it, you're, you're, you have privacy. And I always use French doors. So um, basically, I don't think you can have a better window than a French door, because it's a door and a window. And um, it's 2.6 meter high ceilings. And just that's what characterizes the development, it's what gives the buildings their proportions, and it kind of simplifies things. So you can actually do unusual things with a plan form, but work with making patterns that are born from sort of elements that have good proportions. And this is how the building relates to Gorefield House, or one of our buildings, which I think is kind of important, that three generations of London architecture frame a garden square, which is public. And then the Muse buildings, which wrap around and um, over, overlook the Muse. So this, these principles have informed the next project, which is at a slightly bigger scale, that have much scarier buildings on the site um, that uh, basically demonstrate all of the problems of sort of 70s brutalist urban design of huge slab blocks with a single entrance and parking podiums. And they're super dangerous places and with gangs and all sorts of problems that create a, a kind of exclusionary model in, in its urban and architectural form. So these have been torn down. And we have replaced them with a more or less straightforward urban block with long mansion blocks, bar buildings, um, framing the street, a taller building at one end, and a sort of point building at the south to allow sunlight into communal gardens. And this, this plan is a kind of evolution of the last plan I showed you, where there are three flats per floor, per core, rather than two. And then the little maple leaf building, I call it, has a central core and um, corner flats all around it. And these are 100% social rent. So in this little tower in this end of our mansion block, so the idea, it's actually a, a rule, it's a law in London that you cannot distinguish between affordable social housing and private housing. It all has to look exactly the same. And this is a great policy. Um, and so what's important is that you design housing that allows that to happen seamlessly and any way it can change over time. In this scheme, we also have the duplexes on the top floor. Um, and so the flats at the bottom run through. And I thought here was an, an opportunity to kind of explore the mansard roof and the way mansard roofs allow you to do things like dormers and um, that punctuate the roof line. This is a very long building. And here it was about creating a pattern of vertical elements that actually 
refer to and emphasize the view to the spire of this church at the end of the road. So when I work on these projects, we're always working in 3D, we're always working in perspective. I don't work in elevations at all. I think elevations are the worst things to have to design, but when you're working in a 3D model and you're constantly designing in perspective, um, the elevations emerge from that process. And so the, the big porticos are about sort of breaking up the proportions and the, the numbers of windows and emphasizing the communal entrances. And these are, these are all porches and the buildings have uh, balconies on the front and the back. So it's probably got double the amount of balconies that a normal developer project would, would allow. But because the local authority commissioned the competition and we won the competition with this design, and the local authority says, that's the scheme I want. And then the developers bid for the project and build it without questioning it. So it's a win-win it's a model where the council gets what they want, architects can compete and do the best they can, and the, the market actually still builds it and still makes money. So it's, it's a very interesting model. Um, these this building and, um, well, all of our buildings generally have higher ceilings on the top floor, so you have three meter high ceilings on the top floor, and this is a sort of um, room within a room that you get with recessed balconies. We've also been invited to do some higher density schemes in London, and this is, uh, I call it the adaptable tower, which is in the Greenwich Peninsula, so this is the Millennium Dome, and this is a, a new kind of mini city of 150,000 people that is um, being developed by um, a Hong Kong developer and a master plan by Allies and Morrison, and the developer invited us to design one of the plots on in this scheme. And so we we always do a lot of research into the history of places before we start designing to understand the kind of uh, the memories and the, the, the layers and patterns of use over time. And we were really inspired by the, the cast iron strapping on these chimneys, the tapered forms, the Victorian um, structure, cast iron structure of the, of the um, jetties. And our idea for this project was to kind of subvert the traditional tower model of, of towers on a podium as sort of objects and approach it as a kind of monolithic, more sculptural piece that allows more light into what is a super dense development. It's 400 units on one block. And so this is the, the kind of arrangement where the corners of the scheme are held by sort of um, power elements which splay and angle out to allow every, every unit to have a view to the park. And I'm only going to show one image of this project, but what's, what we had to really fight for here was these continuous loges all the way around the, the building, well, uh, all across the front and um, various places around the sides to create the sheltered uh, balconies that are so well used when they're provided. And, and then they taper towards the top. So this was about allowing more light into the base and um, sort of emphasizing the slenderness and actually accommodating a huge array of different flat sizes within, the, within um, a relatively tight building envelope. And we've, all, we've since then done more competitions, um, for example, in King's Cross in London, which is here, um, next to Regent's Park, which is here. The South Kilburn that I was talking about before is over here. Sorry, it's here. <laughs> so uh, North London, most of my projects. King's Cross is the uh, one of the most successful examples of large-scale urban regeneration based around transport hubs, I think, in the world right now. It's basically gone from being a, a really, well, a kind of uh, rail hub with King's Cross Station here and St. Pancras Station here and coal drops and industrial space to the north. And it was a 
I think it took 20 years to get the master plan consented uh, by Camden Council. And the whole place has been developed um, with a huge amount of care. The um, granary, granary square, the amphitheater, the canal, uh, the commissioning of buildings, Chipperfield, Eric Perry, Michelle Mosesian. Um, basically, every building is, comes up for competition, and all of it is basically um, designed within a super high quality public realm. And there's a new Google headquarters here that's going to be Heatherwick with Big. And we won a competition for this site here, um, which is right at the top of, of Lewis Cubit Park. So it's sort of long and narrow park. And it kind of completes the overall master plan and provides a destination. So this is our site in the context of, of the development. And here, I thought, was an opportunity to sort of bring the, the um, incredible restored identity of King's Cross Station with its enormous arches um, that were sort of spectacular when they were uh, first built and now have been restored to their former glory. And St. Pancras Station itself, with its incredible red brick and Gothic arches, a different language of arches, um, but both of them are such treasured landmarks in the city. And I felt that this project would be an opportunity to bring some of that identity and kind of uh, distinctiveness to the top of the master plan. So our site, like most of our sites, was a kind of funny shape. So we ended up doing a sort of inflected um, pentagon. And it's a courtyard building with commercial and retail in the ground floor. Um, and what we originally designed as a, as a public courtyard is now private, but it has a reflecting pool and may over time become public. And this was the kind of, these are the sort of massing parameters we were given that are fixed, that come out of every master plan in London, a height parameter and offset from the street, the way we kind of carve it to create the right depths of the buildings for residential use. And then the kind of, oh, also there's a tube line going under the building here, so we couldn't build high on this part of the site. And the structure spans the tracks. So the idea here was to create a, a kind of urban tableau where the variety of the, of the um, building heights and depths creates a, um, a kind of cityscape within a building block. And the uh, most significant thing was bringing the idea of an arched building that meets the ground with this um, kind of lyrical colonnade of varying sized bezier arches that also sort of jump through the building to create a, a sort of um, crown. <laughs> and that this colonnaded base allows public access sort of through and all around the building and a, and a sort of threshold from two sides of the development. And this was a sort of view from the top floor. So we won that competition and spent a, a year packing, packing units into um, a really hard working footprint with lots of complicated geometries and really getting to know the language of arches and how you make them um, from brick, whether precast or hand laid, and sort of working on the the way brick brickwork wants to behave when it is asked to be an arch and and how to actually accommodate the varying ellipsoidal forms around the base. And Argent, who are the um, landowner of King's Cross, they're kind of an amazing client because they care deeply about all of these details. Um, they want to understand how everything works, how everything looks the size of the mortar joints. And, um, and so it's a very tough process, but worth it. Um, and so this is the scheme as it was submitted for planning. And it won planning consent um, in December. And as you can see, as you move around the building, it changes. And the base becomes this kind of workspaces and retail spaces that evoke the kind of arches and viaducts that you find around London and the UK. And here is the courtyard. 
with its reflecting pool. After that competition, we won another one with Argent up in Tottenham Hill, which is up here. And this is a completely different context, super suburban, super um, traffic centric. So this kind of place where you come out of the tube and you have no idea where you are. And um, it's all about white vans that drive around at sort of 60 miles an hour. And, but what was interesting about this site was that it was the site of the former Barrel Pencil Factory. I don't know if everybody's used Barrel and Eagle pencils, I'm sure. And we thought, actually, it would be quite nice to sort of reference and uh, recall the memory of the pencil factory somehow in our project. Also, we had an unusually shaped site, a kind of segment of a circle. <clears throat> and we also had the problem of um, a major underground tunnel running right through the center of the site, um, a mainline foul sewer slicing another chunk off the site, and you know the need to accommodate residential depths of buildings and to respond to a new college building right, right behind our building. And so this kind of extractive process of starting with a kind of mass and then carving away to reveal the form is a way we often work. And the, the faceted geometry is, comes a little bit from the pencil reference, but really is about slowing down the speed of traffic and creating vertical lines and shadows and surfaces to counteract the extreme horizontality of, of the context and of the speed of traffic. So again, we're working with a really tight site, uh, commercial spaces all around and cores, a bit of parking, office space on the first floor, and then the residential um, wings above. And this building is, um, it got planning also in December. It's, um, it has a two-story high retail colonnade. Uh, these are the office spaces here. So the idea that residential buildings should be places where you can also work and where you can also shop. And the, the language derives from the idea of a, of a tight orange skin. And when you carve into that skin, it reveals a faceted um, inner, inner um, mass. And the, the faceted metal reflects light into the residential courtyard. So this is the colonnade and the balconies. And these are the kind of units that we um, try to ensure are delivered by the scheme. And it's going to be the, the kind of landmark project for Tottenham Hill that gives it its new identity and sort of a new urban quality and a new grain to um, create a, a kind of new dense neighborhood. So this, this slide actually represents a, a lot of the typologies that we've developed over many years. Um, but I'm going to, and all of these have been really important lessons and I felt were really important to um, deliver uh, while we actually still competed for cultural projects and education projects because I feel that housing design is a is the social project of architecture, and all architects have a duty to the city to create um, really high quality of life, everyday life for everybody in the city. And so it's something that I encourage all graduate architects to um, move into to also demonstrate that housing, housing design is um, its architecture with a capital A, and there's maybe nothing more important. Of course, there are, are other types that actually deliver the, um, the cultural context and the social context in which we live and, and work in the city and in daily life. And this project is the Cohen, Quadri Cohen Quadrangle in Oxford that we won a competition for in um, 2011. And you all know that Oxford is the city of dreaming spires and an incredible UNESCO World Heritage Site, very difficult to build anything in the historic center. 
And what's amazing about the city is that the actual city fabric is made of quadrangles. And each one of these quadrangles represents a college. And so the, the urban form is actually completely um, uh, tied to the pedagogical model, which is the Oxford and Cambridge collegiate model of teaching, where you live and work and are taught in a quadrangle as a community. So the city itself is made of, of quads primarily. And Exeter College is one of the most ancient colleges on this, um, in Oxford. And it has this site, which is here. So um, the kind of old quad and new quad and scholar's garden. And this is the, the um, Radcliffe camera and the Sheldonian theater and the Divinity Library. Like, it's just the most incredibly beautiful and uh, steeped in history place you could imagine. And the competition brief was to sort of take the model of the collegiate ideal and reinvent it for the 21st century. So the brief of the project was to incorporate all these different programs, quarters lodge, teaching rooms, seminar rooms, lecture hall, archives, study bedrooms, fellows apartments, common rooms, family kitchens, um, dining hall, and we, so the, the building acts like a campus in itself, and then we added through the competition process more elements to the brief, which were cloisters, a social learning space, a cafe restaurant tied to it, and, and the courtyards. And the project was intended to fulfill, um, well, be part of the 700 year anniversary celebrations at the college. So you can see here that the client is is one who cares about longevity and um, over time and meaning. And, um, but it was not a project without a budget. It actually had a, a tight budget, and so we worked within strict parameters. Again, in our, our research, we sort of studied the history and evolution of quads in Oxford and Exeter College, whose, whose um, quads are made of different buildings. Uh, forming the perimeter of a shared green and really characterized by a highly articulated roofscape. And then the traditional format of rooms around stairs. So how, um, how can that typology of, of staircases, which are totally inaccessible for any wheelchair users, um, how could this sort of well-loved model of thin buildings, double transparency, be transformed for the future. And this is the kind of type of space that, that you find in Exeter College. And the, this chapel by George Gilbert Scott is uh, the finest example of neo-Gothic architecture in, or one of the finest in, in England. So the competition site was this long and narrow site because there's no land left in central Oxford. And so we had to kind of deal with this condition of, of um, sort of being embedded in partly a sort of residential neighborhood and partly institutional Oxford and with an existing historic building, <coughs> Ruskin College. And so there's Ruskin. And um, this is the 1913 Ruskin College, which was a site of really important um, social uh, protest movements in the 1970s and was part of the access movement to education for working people. That, the facade was listed, and we had to keep it during the design process. But what, was, what we were able to do was, well, it's a completely new build building. And at the competition stage, we showed a huge number of possibilities in terms of how the site could be configured. Um, this was at the first stage of the competition. And at the second stage, we had to produce a complete design. And our concept um, we, that, in a way, transformed the way the site works and offered new opportunities was this S-shaped quad. And what that S-shaped quad do, did was allow us to create a journey, what I call a three-dimensional ambulatory where the building creates a narrative of moving from the institutional frontage through the building, through its teaching spaces, to a social learning 
commons at its center, another cloister, and then the auditorium. And this is a three-dimensional landscape with amphitheaters and ramps down through the cloisters that's connected to the courtyards. And this idea of a continuous ambulatory, which creates a whole series of different experiences of the site and opportunities for encounter. This is the plan. So um, again, the sort of plan form of Porter's Lodge, seminar and public and teaching rooms, a cloister, amphitheater, learning commons, teaching rooms, cloister, and um, auditorium at the end. And the principle of this was that the section works very hard with new mansard roofs to um, increase the uh, accommodation on the site. And the kind of place of maximum horizontal and vertical movement would be the, the learning commons. The, this is a kind of uh, the, the model at competition stage and the, the point at which we decided to explore making the roof out of a single material that's cut and folded, similar to earlier projects I discussed, and that this, this single material allows a series of stepped forms to be unified, um, sort of formally and materially. And that creates a whole series of sectional possibilities. Um, it's actually a six-story building disguised as a three-story building, and the roof forms actually deflect to pull light in from the south or enclose dramatic spaces for teaching rooms and student rooms. Um, and this, this is what happens when you intersect a curved mansard roof with a straight dormer. You get a kind of automatic, wonderful thing that um, you didn't really have to try very hard to, to make. And it's one of the joys of working with roofs, with roof forms instead of flat roofs. It's, there's expressive and spatial possibility. And this act so um, shows the kind of controlling geometry of the two cloisters. The, the south cloister is a, um, is a convex ellipse. The, the space it describes is a convex ellipse. Um, and then the north cloister describes a concave ellipse. And so these two cloisters create, again, a, a sort of journey uh, that's not a corridor, but an experience from the Porter's Lodge through to the auditorium. So the building, these are the, the, the plans that are, you can see are working quite hard at the student room level. No, no dead end corridors. There's always a window at the end of the corridors. The student kitchens, communal family kitchens are at the center, also looking into courtyards on either side. Fellows teaching rooms under the roof and um, under the top level of the roof. And it all comes together a bit like this. So this is the retained facade, the kind of um, plinth of public and teaching spaces, cloisters, student rooms, and the enveloping roof. And the, the kind of crux of the new identity for the project was, is the roof. And we, um, I felt it was important to refer to the, the iconography and language of the of the Gilbert Scott, um, well, of the old Turtle Street quad, the Gilbert Scott spire of the chapel and its beautiful lead work on the, on the steeple, um, represents an attitude to the arts and crafts movement that you also find in the no local neighborhood with checkerboard brick and the patterning of the, uh, of the internal spaces of the quad. And so this created, uh, this was the inspiration for the language, the checkerboard material of the roof and, um, and the way it envelops the, the student body is, um, is represented by the roof sort of enclosing and wrapping the, the um, accommodation. So we went through about a year of uh, a year and a half of consultations. We had to more or less publish a book for each public consultation. This is the, the list. It goes from, you can see it goes from 2011 to 2014. That's how long it took to get planning consent. Um, good things come to those who spend a lot of time um, delivering consultation documents. 
Um, this is the stainless steel roofing uh, material <laughs> being stippled and um, etched in Enfields in northwest London. And these are the one-to-one -one mock ups that we built on site to demonstrate to the planners that the roof would not glare so much that it would cause local cars to melt or change the temperature of the, um, of the neighborhood, which is where some of the objections that came t forward in the planning process. And this is the construction sequence, so completely demolished sites and the piles going in, the retained facade, concrete frame, steel roof, the auditorium coming in, glue lamp structure fabricated in the Netherlands. So the auditorium as a kind of jewel in a quad construction process. A very happy roofer putting in the stainless steel shingles. And I mean, I say that kind of lightly, but it's serious because the, the idea of bringing a craft, a building craft to this building was very important for me. Um, William Morris is an alumnus of Exeter College. William Morris was a student of Ruskin. Um, art, the art and craft of building is something that we've, we've been gradually losing over the past uh, 100 years. And I think it's really important to allow craftsmanship and uh, building trades that involve that kind of craft to be, to be uh, utilized and celebrated in that arts and crafts tradition. So this is, again, it's a bit under construction, but you can see the way the sort of roof form starts as a, as a curved mansard and becomes a surface that wraps and folds down along the street. And the journey starts um, through the portal of the 1913 building. We, we also lowered the windows by a meter. The, old, the existing building, the window sills were up here. And so we lowered the windows to allow the, the building, well, we eliminated all the stairs and we allowed the building to be more open and accessible. Um, this is the Porter's Lodge. So you come through the portal into a contemporary, fully contemporary environment. You can see the South Quad, um, the stairs, inviting students to use the stairs and the academics. Um, Again, pigeonholes, um, staircase up. There are really only f four or five materials in the building. Stone, limestone floors and walls, concrete, obviously, for the ceiling, cherry wood, and brass. And I tried to stick to those four materials throughout the, the project, as little drywall as possible. This is the, the signage that, again, expresses that kind of craftsmanship. And the South Cloister, which is fully glazed, but also timber, so it creates a very warm environment that also changes throughout the day, depending on the quality of light. You can see into the teaching rooms as you move along the cloister and out, so everybody always feels um, safely visible um, if you're alone in, in one of the teaching rooms. Here's one of the large seminar rooms with the retained um, kind of Palladian windows. And then at the center of the building, the learning commons, which is on four levels that connects through to two courtyards. So here it's looking through to the north courtyard, and there's a lower sort of study mezzanine, um, the suspended study room on one side. And then looking south, you see through to Worcester College grounds, the wall walk, um, a different kind of study and workspace. That you, and you can move down through this space to the lower level where there's a cafe and um, access to the archive and archivist's room there. And this, this space, which is a sort of triple height space at the bottom of the Learning Commons, is the most popular space in the whole building, that people always sit here. And it sort of proves my point that you can never have a ceiling that's too high. And atriums are not the way to um, express that, but creating spaces that allow inhabitation of different scales, different proportions, but always connected to each other and to the landscape. So even at basement level, you can see the trees of, of Worcester College and um, have a sense of the weather, the passing of, of time throughout the day, 
all of the corridors are wide enough to take um, study carrels or study tables. This is um, looking towards the archive store, and these are William Morris stained glass windows that the college bought um, during the project. And um, again, sort of celebrate their artistic and philosophical tradition. And this is the, the North Cloister, which is concrete, so completely different quality of light because it's facing north. And the teaching rooms allow um, full transparency to allow natural light. And the foyer to the auditorium. This is a William Morris rug that just happened to fit on the only four meter by four meter <coughs> concrete wall <coughs> in the building. So it was an amazing coincidence there. <coughs> so this is the, the kind of setting out of the auditorium, which was really complicated because it's a polygon or a trapezoid in plan. So the, the curvature of these surfaces, are they're actually cones, which are difficult to set out. Um, quite complicated doing details for a roof that turns upside down, sort of halfway along its length. But the idea here was to have a column-free space. It's not that big a site, and it's not that big a space. So these sort of wishbone columns support this roof, and it's suspended. And that gives this incredible sense of lightness in the, in the auditorium. And the clear story is not something you look at, but something that pulls, pulls light down into the space. And so the, then the journey takes you um, out of the ground floor and up the stairs, which provide views into other parts of the building as you, as you move up them. And then the corridors uh, of student rooms, these are the only places where drywall made it <laughs> into the building, pretty much. Um, and you can see the windows at the end of the corridors. And then there are the family kitchens at the, um, at the um, sort of intersection of the, of the wings. And the, so students can cook on islands. There's a big island and a big kitchen. And they, they normally have tables of 12. And these are the student rooms, which um, some of which, about 30 of which, benefit from the curved roofs. So you have double height curved roofs um, above the study, well, in the, in the entire room. This is the south quad, which is shaded by trees. And then as you move up through the building, the, the fellow studies are under the roof. And the idea here was to create real places of what I describe as places of desire, where you create places that are um, memorable, that are places you want to go, and where students would want to go to have their seminars and tutorials with their tutors, and actually have um, the opportunity to enjoy these kinds of spaces up under the roof, and from there to be able to look into all the parts of the college. So this is the, um, the final uh, result of many years of work. I, it was really seven years from the competition to, to completion. But what was really important about this project in the context of Oxford and um, in terms of the context of, of um, the collegiate model of teaching was that we were able to completely really reinvent the language and form of, of the quad on a super constrained site, but provide a huge array of spaces and choice and freedom for um, the student and sort of scholarly community who use the building. And the, the language of kind of a sinuous and shimmering cloak that envelops that community is, is really the opposite of the traditional um, flat-roofed institution or the spires of Oxford and for me speaks of the idea of home that the building is a scholarly home and it creates the kind of intimacy and shelter and non-institutional spatial qualities that you you get from from your home so this project is is part of uh, is now a part of this urban figure ground plan and it's the s is doing what it says, sort of responding to different parts of the city, and um, becoming a kind of 
trigger for new ways of thinking about how we, how we occupy and respond to historic contexts and create community. So I have, um, I have a little video about the Venice Biennale, but I know I've run out of time. I've overshot the time. So if anybody wants to stay, I can just show the video. And it might be a nice way to end the project, because there's elements in the video from, from the Cohen Quad, from our housing projects. So I will just scoot through the slides till I get to the video. The Biennale theme was free space. <laughs> This, this was the Arsenale where we exhibited. And um, this video, um, well, our, th our scheme, our proposal is called Recasting. It's a series of, of totemic elements on a plinth. This was our initial design. These four elements each express an aspect of free space related to housing design inhabited edge, threshold, roof space, and passage. And each one, I'll just skip through, creates a sort of immersive experience um, of the arches of our King's Cross project, a scheme in Bath, a Cordia, and our Cohen Quad. And these were uh, the renders we um, did when we were testing the scheme. And basically producing the cutting schedules for all the timber. We developed the structure with Arup. What's really fascinating about uh, Arup scheme is that the screws act as rebar. So it's all plywood. It's poplar plywood. And the shims create the compressive um, arches and the tension ring for the arch so that it doesn't explode. <clears throat> so it's all about the screws, which is kind of unusual. And then ways of lightening the structure by just cutting big holes, which created very interesting optical effects. And we worked with wonderful craftsmen who are based outside of Oxford. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the video here. And these are some details. I think this is the video. So this, this element is about inhabited edges. Um, this one is about roofscape in roof space. And the arch is about threshold, a threshold um, as free space. And the, this vertical totem is um, it's kind of the cloister from the Cohen Quad turned vertical. So when you lie down, you see the cloister. You can't fix anything into the ground of the Venice Biennale, so you have to make it self-supporting with the platform. <clears throat> so you can see there's a mirror at the top there, and that's what creates the illusion of a very long um, cloister that you'll see in a minute.
there, there are mirrors on either side of that arch in the secondary arch, so when you stand in the arch, it goes <laughs> into infinite space on both sides. The idea of the four um, elements clustered around the platform was to create a civic space at the center. So the four elements together work to create another kind of free space, which is the space between buildings. And the amphitheater acts as a, obviously a kind of um, place in which you can sit, look at the catalog that we produced, and um, animates animates the space. But mainly for me, it was about creating a place for people to sit in the ben Venice Biennale, because you can walk for hours and hours and there's nowhere to sit. And so um, three of the these totems, we call them, are about just having a place to sit. You had to lie down to get that view on your back and look up. <clears throat> so for, for me also it was a very, a really nice exercise of actually taking the work that we've done and the ideas that we've done that we've actually built and then recasting them as kind of models, as, um, as a, um, a way of experiencing architecture without having to be there, but that evokes all the qualities of, of architecture. So thank you everybody for listening and I'll just conclude by saying hang on to your ideals, never stop fighting for beauty and never give up. Thanks very much. Do you, do you want me to take questions? I'm not sure whether you uh, have time for questions. Um, I think I think it's always enriching. You know, we're we're always kind of guilty uh, as architects of sort of flying in, trying to understand a site, doing a bunch of research, doing a project, and then hoping hoping it's right, um, without the benefit of the knowledge and day-to-day -day experience of people who live there. Um, so it's always really really interesting to hear the feedback, and it, in the case of the Cohen Quad, most of it was English heritage, you know, historic England and the Oxford Preservation Trust and um, bodies like that. 
who actually have a series of principles that they want to fight for, whereas local residents have a completely different set of requirements. But what was, uh, like I was really glad that the building, the facade was listed because I think it tells a story. Like it would have been fantastic to have a completely new build building that's, you know, 100% a new work. But actually I think the listed facade tells a story of the place and of, um, and also of, of uh, my client and the legacy, the intellectual legacy and tradition of Ruskin, Ruskin and Morris. And, you know, so it's all kind of tied together. Um, it's difficult when you've done a competition also. The consultation, you know, you're presenting a vision and you didn't consult because you had eight weeks to design the whole building and <laughs> there was no time to consult. So a lot of what it is about, and, and I think there's an advantage to that because you come with fresh eyes. You, you see what's fantastic about the place, you have no inhibitions, you're not used to it, and you, you really go for it and you try to bring everything, you know, every ideal and every ideal situation to the project. And then you have to explain that. So a lot of, a lot of the consultation over the three years was just about explaining what we've done and why. And once people understand your motivations and what you're trying to achieve and how you've achieved it, they, you know, they actually engage and usually end up supporting that, that vision. But, but I, do think, I do think you need to have a vision and you need to actually um, you know, trust your instincts and bring fresh ideas to places. Um, it's very hard to actually develop a project when you're compromising from the word go and then hope that something pure and great will come out at the end. I think that's really, really difficult. Anybody who can do that, I you know, really admire. <laughs> Right, oh, thank you. I mean, that was a, a competition that we unfortunately lost. Yeah. <laughs> um, but and unless it's a different project that you're, you're thinking about, um, we, we didn't build that. Actually, Hennigan Peng won that competition. Because it was listed on uh, one of the sites on the internet as an aerosol. Oh, right. Well, that's really good. If, if, every, <laughs> if everybody thinks... She came here recently. She was here recently. Oh, right. Okay. So, you know, we have a habit of bringing in brilliant female speakers. <laughs> <laughs> but it does, it, in a way, it sort of demonstrates the value of competitions. Like, even if you don't win, you've done a piece of work. It's part of your portfolio. It's research and development. You can bring that knowledge, that body of knowledge, to your next project, and maybe even people will think that you built it, which is, <laughs> which is great. Well, I also the so they were amazing. Oh, right. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. They're all coming from the front row. Yeah. <laughs> Need some students. students to yeah. ask you a question. But, um, well, it's a fabulous presentation. Thank you. It's really beautiful work. Um, one of the things that strikes me is the relationship between the traditional references uh, and the innovative use of technology. So some people like to draw a hard line between history and the future. Right? And, and clearly you're embracing this idea of fusion between them. And I think that's one of the wonderful characteristics of, of the work that's present maybe in, in throughout all of them. I just wonder like when did you 
pick that up? Was that maybe on arrival in London and recognizing the richness, or was this something from Waterloo, or you know, where did you get this affinity? Maybe it's a generational thing as well, uh, and not being afraid of history. Right. Well, it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, I mean, I kind of grew up in a family that was obsessed by history, and my mother loved the arts and crafts period. She loved William Morris and um, loved architecture. So she was always showing, showing me, you know, beautiful barns and farmhouses and just pointing out things like the Romanesque architecture in Toronto. It, she just took the time to point out what was what she thought was wonderful. And I suppose that had a, an effect on me. Um, I think the University of Waterloo was definitely um, sort of reinforced that because of its cultural history program, the iconography course, um, and then going to Rome in the fourth year. Um, it, you know, it's sort of, I was a kind of diehard modernist um, <laughs> probably until really the salt house when I started to sort of think, okay, I think I can take on the pitched roof and it can become something else other than a kind of, you know, disdained um, element of architecture as the modernists had kind of treated it. And probably just living in the UK and kind of constantly being inspired Inspired by the incredible richness, and um, uh, you know, it's sort of you gradually start to realize that the 19th century was actually amazing for architects and for architecture. They just they just had so much fun working with, you know, reference and style and interpreting historic um, styles, but also transforming them, but being very joyful and being very uh, free in the way they approach their work. Um, I think there's a famous quote by James Joyce, creativity is memory. You know, you can't be created, creative if you don't have memories. And, and, you know, when you, you know, instinct is probably mostly memory. And you may not know where an idea comes from, but it just comes out and think, well, it comes from somewhere. And, so this idea that you need to reject the past to be a, like a true modernist is completely fallacious, I think. It's a, it's a giant red herring <laughs> that um, kind of inhibited architects and architecture for, you know, since the early 20th century. And it's taking us a long time to free ourselves from that um, um, kind of stranglehold, really. Like even designing with arches, you know. Oh my god, <laughs> you know, an arch. How dare I do an arch? But actually, all of the arched buildings of the last sort of 250 years, like none of them were load-bearing arches. They were all, you know, they're all steel frame buildings that have beautiful Romanesque arches within them. And so this idea that you can't do an arch unless it's like Roman masonry, <laughs> Is, is another kind of myth, a kind of dogma that we all have, you know, suffered from in the 20th century. So I think it's an incredible time of sort of liberation from, from that dogma for, you know, the new generation of architects that are emerging, don't, were never modernists, and they don't have to worry about modernism anymore, and they can actually just, you know, look and see and learn from what's around them, or we can look um, and do that collectively and invent from, from, from that sort of direct experience. And, and I think this is, uh, so history, I, I say like history has always been my ally because I can argue for quite extreme things on the basis that, you know, the inspiration comes from something historic that people know and people love. And, and so it's very useful as a way of, um, of kind of pushing through things that are quite experimental, but are rooted in a sort of collective memory. 